Good morning, Altar's Gate.
She's amazing. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's real good about, you know, I'm not a real structured person, so she keeps things kind of the way they need to be. <laughs> and uh, so she's awesome to work with, too, and she loves these kids. Oh, my gosh, she, she's just wonderful. So, so how, how long is the program? Uh, it's uh, once a week from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Usually we don't get out until 8.30, but usually 6.30 to 8 o'clock is our hours. And it's, it's, it's a good time. It's plenty of time for the kids to just unwind and usually after school or, you know, a long day. It's, it's, a, it's a good time for them. So, yeah. And then how many, uh, how many weeks is the program? It's 13 weeks and it uh, parallels the four share uh, curriculum for the adults. So our lessons kind of will parallel the adult lessons. So it's, it's a really cool setup we have here. And then, um, so if someone out here is interested in joining the program, um, who do they talk to for more information? You. <laughs> If you don't know how to reach Fran or me, you can uh, contact the church office and Debbie will refer you. Um, one last question. So um, if someone is interested in bringing their own kids or grandkids or neighbors, is that possible? You bet. Is it a charge for the program? No, no charge. Uh, just bring them. Um, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, um, uh, Wednesday nights, uh, it's, it's, you know, no charge at all. So bring your kids, sign up to help us. We love this program. It's a great ministry in the church. And um, we just don't have quite enough workers to um, cover needs in case something happens or a worker needs a break. So um, we could really use somebody to come alongside us to help, um, to help uh, grow this ministry. Thank you all very much. I must say that I have been a part of that program. It took about three sessions to get me started. <laughs> Well, I just want to put a ditch over that. This is, I don't know if you know this, but Divorce Care is the longest running ministry in this church. And it is, in my opinion, one of the greatest things we do is to offer to our community here. It all the state does. So, I think you would be blessed. I peek my head in to watch those kids sometime, and it is amazing. But what, what you can see the pain and the hurting in some of those kids, and it's beautiful to watch our people minister to them. So if you feel a little tuggy on you, you need to, you need to get involved there. Um, a special welcome today. I've been in this this uh, district of the United Methodist Church for almost 45 years. Been through a lot of district superintendents, but none better than Joe Fort. And he's here this morning with his wife, Margaret, and the little Joe. You guys stand up in the room. I mean that with all my heart, Joe. I, I can never recall anyone who was better for this church and loved this church more than you. Amen. And little Joe. We miss you, little Joe. We do. Amen. They just retired about a year ago and live back in our community again, so we welcome them here. Come on, church. Let's stand and worship the King.
I'm no longer 
make our way through this world. Lord, that you have provision for us to have our sins forgiven. And so we confess, uh, Lord, right now that we have failed to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We fail to love our neighbors. We have not done what we ought to do, and we have left undone that which we should. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness. We thank you for the righteousness of Christ that covers us and makes us worthy to receive this holy meal. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now before Pastor Regina comes and begins our uh, reading of the scripture and the liturgy around the, the bread and the cup, let me say to you that if you are a Christian today, if you know Jesus Christ, you are welcome at this table. Amen. This is the Lord's table. This is not a, a Methodist table. This is not Aldersgate's table. This is the Lord's table. And so you're welcome to come if you've trusted Christ. If you've not trusted him, we pray that even in this moment, you consider giving your heart and life and mind and soul and strength to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's wonderful. Amen. And he will uh, save you and he will make you new. So... Um, you're welcome to, to sit or stand, whatever you feel like, but Pastor Regina is coming to pray over the, the bread and the cup. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, He gave it to the disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. And he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is for my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance me. So God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Spirit. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen, amen. and amen. Uh, will those that are assisting this morning in serving uh, come down to the front and we'll have three stations. Uh, we'll all queue up in the center aisle. So you come as the Spirit leads you. You won't be dismissed row by row. You just come as you feel led. Make your way to one of the two stations on the outside. And then the very center station will have the uh, gluten-free bread that you can take. Now, having taken then the cup, you'll go back to your seat. And we'll take the bread together. And we'll drink the cup together in just a few moments. But you come now as the Spirit leads you. Uh, the table is set. The Lord invites you. Come now. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Oh, <laughs> 
sorrows made him his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. body of Christ, take and eat in remembrance of him. The blood of Christ shed for us. Drink all of it and do it in remembrance of him. <laughs> and now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer which Christ taught his disciples to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. And we come upon this story of Jacob, and we'll read 
that in just a moment, but one of the things that I pointed out last time was that there was a big struggle with God, and it was a surprise because um, Jacob, when this man comes and jumps on him, apparently from behind, and grabs him and gets him in a bear hug, something like what uh, Joseph Chamberlain likes to do to me when he sees me, he comes up <laughs> behind me, and I can't move, and I, I feel like I'm in a vice grip by a, a Russian bear has got a hold of me, and I, I know that Jacob is sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, somehow in the night, Esau has made his way across the river, and he's, uh, he's jumped me, and I can't get free. And it was a surprise, I think, to Jacob, and a surprise to you and me, that in fact he was wrestling with the Lord. That's a surprise. I, I've been uh, involved in this mystery called the life of faith for 53 years. And I can tell you that, that, that many of the things that I'm learning now and have learned through the years remain a mystery. I look back on that date in June of 1968, when I came to faith in Christ, and just like John Wesley, I knew that I knew that I knew that the only reason uh, that I could come to God's, into God's presence was because of what Christ had done for me. And for the first time did I trust in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. I have depended upon uh, my mom and dad's spirituality that are raising us in a Christian home, but I had to come to that place where I had to accept the faith for myself. And young people, let me just say that that's a critical thing. It's, uh, the data will show that many of our young people walk away from the faith after they graduate from high school, but I contend that they never had it. They never had that wrestling with God to come to that place where they give themselves wholeheartedly and completely to, to Christ and receive Him as Savior and Lord. You can walk away from something that you never had. Well, it's been uh, an amazing thing. It was several months later at the Peace Chapel in the Lakeview Retreat Center, our conference retreat center. And on a weekend, an ashram weekend, I came to understand what it meant to let the Holy Spirit of God baptize me and fill me and change me and make me new. Amen. So at 14, man, I was on fire. I was burning hot for the Lord. Get out of my way. I got the four spiritual laws memorized. Testifying to anyone and everyone that would just give me a look do you know Jesus? And of course it helped kind of back in the day to be a, a, a Jesus freak, kind of a, a, a saved hippie. You know, and you were an oddity to say the least if you start talking about the Lord. You know, they, they listened to your testimony and wish that you had somehow found a, some sure for your body of her. <laughs> we thought somehow, you know, the more you smell, the more spiritual you were. <laughs> uh, 
But at 14, nobody warned me, nobody told me that somewhere, at some point, down the road, I would have a crisis of faith. I would have a dark night of the soul. My first one came just within a couple of years when my father died from a heart attack. And I remember being in the waiting room at the hospital as they were working on it. And I remember being there with several of our youth from the youth group, and I began to testify, oh, God's going to heal him. God's going to save him. And he's going to be just fine. Because I prayed, and I asked God to save my father. And he's going to do it. Only to have the doctor come out 20 minutes later and say he's gone. Well, you know, you're 16 years old and you're grieving the loss of your parent. But that was the first in a series of decades and decades and decades of challenges to my faith. And if you've lived a little bit, then you know kind of what I'm talking about. If you're still young and, and uh, completely optimistic, I don't want to rain on your parade. I want you to be as happy as you can for as long as you can. But I just want to tell you, there's a mystery to living by faith. And Amen. it's a mystery that will be probably unsolved the whole time we sojourn on this planet. Till we get to the other side. You know, this mystery is the kind of the watershed moment, if you will, is when we discover that the Christian experience is a death to self. Amen. It's a death, a dying to ourselves. See, I, I think we get duped sometimes into thinking that God wants to do a, an extreme makeover on us. You know, just like those glamour shots. I don't know if you remember those. That were a big thing back in the uh, several decades ago now. But they would basically take, uh, and I ain't really even more soon, recent than that with the television shows, they would do extreme makeovers. Then they started making over houses. Uh, but you would basically see this kind of a plain looking individual and through the artistry of makeup and hairstyling and clothes and, and uh, fitness programs and spas and all that stuff, they, they come out looking like um, beautiful or handsome individual. They've had an extreme makeover. And I think we as Christians sometimes think that that's what God is trying to do with us. He's wanting to do a makeover on us. He's wanting to make us pretty and handsome. But if I'm understanding this story of Jacob, and let's go ahead and read that now, we're going to find out something that is kind of a surprise. Genesis 32. Genesis 32. It's there in your bulletin. I'll begin reading in verse 24. And I'll stop at verse 30. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled it with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against it. The man touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. 
And the man said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And the man blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When the man asks Jacob, what is your name? He's not just asking that for that name, but he's asking Jacob to divulge and to share and communicate with him. What are you known for? <laughs> See, in Hebrew, they would say, who are you? He would say, well, I'm Mario. Who are you? But when they say, what is your name? What they're saying is, what are you known by? What kind of name do you have for yourself? What kind of name are you making for yourself? When people say your name, what do they think of? Wow. And uh, Jacob has to say, well, and of course we learned this last time that the word Jacob means supplanter or cheater or deceit, a deceitful person. One who trips somebody up. And so, when the man asks Jacob, he's not saying, who are you? I, I know who you are. He's saying to Jacob, what are you known for, Jacob? And Jacob has to say, well, I, I'm known for being a chief. <laughs> and a liar. And deceitful. You see... The wrestling match, they were not interested in a makeover. The angel was interested in going right into the very guts Amen. of Jacob and ripping that Jacob out of him Amen. and changing him. I believe that one of the biggest struggles that you and I have in our Christian experience is a struggle with superficiality. Superficiality. You see, sin covers up. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? They hid themselves. They covered up. And of course, we know that they were provided skins to cover themselves up. And what we have tended to do as we have struggled with this sin issue in our lives is we'll cover it up. And what God wants to do is unmask it. Amen. He wants to clean us up Amen. down at the very core of who we are. God <coughs> has us on this path, friends. And if you want to uh, understand that it is a lifelong battle, all you have to do is read the headlines. Most of the music that we do in this church comes to us from a ministry that when you go on the Pandora channel, you pull this particular Pandora channel up and I guarantee you, you listen to that particular channel and you will hear all the songs that we do. All the songs that we do. 
I love it. I love to listen to them. But only recently, one of the leaders of that ministry, a foundational leader of that ministry, achieving success through the books written and through the messages preached and through that particular ministry of music. He had a, a surprising issue with himself. He was relieved of duty because he had an issue with his temper. And you kind of wonder, man, guy's got me on top of the world. Notoriety and all manner of opportunity. And yet, as he has moved through his Christian experience, God had to do a work in him to say, we've got a problem. And he was relieved of duty. Not too far behind that, you read of another Christian leader up in, well, I won't mention the, the state, but it starts with an N and it's got a Y in it. <laughs> and this particular leader, I mean, got it going on. Yep. The church exploding. All kinds of ministry taking place. <clears throat> Members of his church include Justin Bieber and Rihanna. I mean, I know some of y'all look at me and go, who's that? <laughs> Others of you go, are you kidding me? This guy was Justin Bieber's and Rihanna's pastor. He had to be relieved of duty because of an immoral uh, failure, a moral failure with one of the parishioners. It's a mystery. How we can go from the heights of this tremendous experience with God and find a crisis in our faith and discover that we're battling ourselves more often than not. All right. Battling the sin that's inside of us. All right. Oh, we'd rather have a makeover rather than God to go in and do some radical surgery. And so this morning, we're going to open up this altar. Amen. And I don't know what you're struggling with. But if if you're a little at all like anybody else trying to make their way through this Christian experience, there's something in you that God wants to deal with. Amen. Well, what it is. Amen. God knows. The Holy Spirit knows. You've been wrestling and wrestling and wrestling for decades. And it's time to call it what it is. All right. Call it what it is. All right. Name it and say, this is what I struggle with the most. And God, I need you to go deep inside of me and rip it out of me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And make me new because I want to finish well. I don't want to end up on the front page of the paper. Amen. Whatever that is. It's between you and God. So, Father, right now, we open up this altar. We open up this time. And we just say to you that we are yours. We want you more than anything else. Lord, we, we, cannot, say, we cannot seek your face and save our own face in the process. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would deal
deal with these places in our lives that we continue to stumble over. We ask that in the end we be like Jacob, that we would see you face to face moving in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. When the altar is open, there will be opportunity for you to come. You just do business with God. You know what he told you this morning. You know what needs to happen. So you just come. We'll wait. If no one comes, that's fine. God, God's not limited to working in your life. Right up here in this altar, he can work right where you're seated. God can work right where you are. Let him do what he wants to do with you this morning and with me. And make us new. You come as the Spirit leads. Lord, I come. I confess.
to those in crisis. So we're blessed. They're in the back, back there, those three beautiful ladies. Right. And they stop by to worship with us this morning. So to all our visitors, welcome, welcome, welcome. Sisters in Christ had a wonderful time yesterday. I also have some bags for y'all to just give to a neighbor, give to a friend, and that those bags are over in front of the, uh, the, the, the cafeteria. So without further ado, let us all bow for the benediction. Father God, we thank you for this time and for your presence, for your healing, for your deliverance, Lord, and for the challenge, Father Lord, for the invite, Father, to allow you to come in, Father, clean up our hearts. So I, I pray, Lord, that, that we've taken the pastor's words, words given uh, from you, that we take it seriously, Father. So, Lord, let's do a heart cleanse right now. David says, create me a clean heart, oh God. Mm -hmm. And renew a new and right spirit within us. So blessings upon each of people, Father, gathered here today. Blessings, Father. Blessings, Father. Blessings, Father, on the, on the gentlemen that visit our our church this morning, Father God, we pray, Lord, for your saving and grace that you bless him, Father God, and his dog, Lord. We pray for his salvation and his deliverance that he would feel your love. And as we come, Lord, and as we go, I thank you for your blessings and for your protection. In the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh Lord. Amen. <laughs> Oh, my Jesus, God, so free. Praise the Lord. 